Okay, so in the last video, I began a study on Thomas Brooks's book uh, called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, and just uh, kind of journeying through this book together. Um, the, I presented to you the first device that Satan uses, the first tactic that he uses against us to try to cause us to fail in our faith and in our faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so today, I wanna, in this video, I want to give you uh, the remedies that Brooks gives to us and outlines for us in his, uh, in his book. Uh, so the first device, the first tactic that we talked about, uh, that we studied in the last video, was simply this. Satan, Satan presents the bait and hides the hook, like any good fisherman. Satan presents the bait and then hides the hook. And so we, we studied from Genesis, uh, we started in Revelation 2 and 3, saw, saw that, um, that Christ's desire for the church, for Christians individually and for the church, local churches collectively, uh, to, to conquer. He, he longs for us to patiently endure the trials and the hardships of this life and then uh, to arrive safely at the end, to conquer, to have conquered uh, in the name of Christ, so that Christ is glorified um, and made much of. Uh, and so this, this being the desire uh, for, of Christ for you today and for me today, we want to know how, how can we combat this first tactic, this first scheme of the devil. Um, as I said, Brooks gives four remedies, and so I want to I give these to you. Uh, today in this video, in the second video. Uh, the first remedy is this. He says, keep at the greatest distance from sin. Makes sense, right? Keep, keep at the greatest distance from sin and from playing with the golden bait which Satan holds forth to catch you. Keep... Keep at a distance. Huh. I mean, we, we should understand that, right? Everybody around us today is, is telling us, keep social distancing, right? Uh, keep, keep a safe and social distance from one another. Well, well here, the, the, remedy, the remedy for us to overcome uh, the tactics and the schemes of, of Satan to get us to fall into temptation is to stay a far, as far away as we can from sin. Um, so, so Christians, Christians are to always be practicing sin distancing, if you will, temptation distancing, that we, that we stay as far away as we can from, from uh, falling into sin, from temptations that come against us. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9, if you want to turn there, Romans 12 uh, verse 9, simply says this. <clears throat> says there, let, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Let love be genuine, Paul says to the Romans. Let love be genuine, not fake, not false. Uh, let your love not be a show for others, but let your love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. The word abhor in verse 9 means to loathe. To loathe, to find repugnant. Um, one definition I saw, it says this, to, to hate something with horror. You think about that, to hate something with horror. For me, for me, it might, and this is, this is going to be an understatement, but for me, it might be something worse than fried eggs. Okay, I can, I can barely watch somebody. I can barely stand to watch somebody eat a fried egg, let alone to eat one myself. It just turns my stomach. Uh, and if I were to eat one, oh, man, I just, I'm, I'm in danger even now of, of heaving. Uh, or or I, I, might, I might think it, I might think that, that a bore, this, this idea of a boring sin, a boring evil, uh, I might think it far worse than, than drinking Pepto-Bismol, which, which triggers my gag reflex and, and immediately induces vomiting. Sorry. Um, but, but, but there are two things, fried eggs and Pepto-Bismol, that turn my stomach. 
and, and so when I think about this word abhor, to, to loathe, to find repugnant, to hate something with horror, that's kind of where, where my mind went. Two things that kind of just turned my stomach. What might it be for you? What turns your stomach? Um, and, and then as you, as you identify that, just, just understand that whatever we identify, whether it's a fried egg or Pepto-Bismol or whatever, um, what, what the Bible is commanding us here is, is to hate sin with a greater hatred. To, to have sin turn our stomach with greater, a greater force, with a greater intensity than even that thing fried egg, Pepto-Bismol, then even that would turn our stomach. Sin, sin should be even more repulsive to me than those two repug repugnant and loathsome substances that I talked about. And so what would you liken it to? On the opposite end, verse 9 also tells us to hold fast to what is good. So, so abhor what is evil, but hold fast to what is good. Hold fast means to cling, to cling on to what is good. Stick to what is good. Stick to it. Uh, we, ought to, we ought to stick, we ought to cling on to that which is good, to that which God loves, to that goodness which represents fully and completely the character of of, of our gracious and good and merciful God. That, that, Christians, that Christians, we ought to be pursuing and loving and clinging on to anything and everything that, that represents the goodness of God. Anselm, famous Christian dead guy, Anselm used to say that if he should see the shame of sin on one hand, and the pains of hell on the other. And, and if he must choose one, the shame of sin or the pains of hell, he said he would rather be thrust into hell without sin than to go into heaven with sin. Wow. He would rather be thrust into hell without sin, if he had to choose one or the other, he'd rather be thrust into hell without sin than to, than to go to heaven with sin because... Why, why is that? Why did he think that? Well, because sin is such an affront to the holiness and to the goodness of Almighty God that, that, listen, those of us who name the name of Christ should have that much of a hatred, that much of a despising for, for that which demeans the character of God, the holiness of God. Think in terms of the men and women of the Bible and relate which ones fled from sin and which ones danced next to the edge of sin. Uh, they, they get right up to the edge of the pit. They get as close as they can uh, to the edge and they flirt with sin saying, oh, sin will never take me down. They're, they're overconfident. They're prideful in their own ability to overcome sin, so they get right up next to the edge, which, which quite frankly is the human tendency. We all tend to want to see in our humanness just how close we can get to the edge without going over. So, so think about the men and women of the Bible and, and think about which ones fled from sin and which ones danced with uh, and flirted with sin and the temptation. Well, immediately Joseph comes to mind. Joseph fled sin at the cost of being wrongfully imprisoned. Joseph would rather be thrown into prison without sin than to live in Potiphar's house and, and having sinned against Potiphar and his wife. Now think about it, that goes right in, right hand in glove with what Anselm said. Joseph loathed sin so much that he was, he was willing and did end up being wrongfully imprisoned. Um, he fled sin. David, on the other hand, King David, a, a man who the Bible describes a man after God's own heart, David danced on the edge of the pit as he leered over his balcony at the naked Bathsheba, and then he allowed his heart to linger there 
And his desires, he allowed his desires to be swept away to the point where he took what his sinful desires wanted. Here's a timely quote from Thomas Brooks. I say it's timely because it relates very much to, to the situation that we find ourselves in today in quarantine uh, because there is a pandemic and, and our movements are limited. And we have, we have this curse of a virus that the whole human race is, is fighting against. What Brooks says is this, sin is a plague. Sin is a plague. Yes, the worst and most infectious plague in the world. And yet, ah, he says, how few are there who tremble at it, who keep a distance from it. Wow. You talk about a timely quote. Let me, let me share it again because I think it's that powerful. Sin is a plague. Yes, the worst and most infectious plague in the world. And yet, ah, how few are there who tremble at it, who keep a distance from it. I didn't add that last part. He said that. See, see the first remedy for us against this first tactic, this first scheme of the devil of, of baiting, the, baiting uh, the hook and hiding the consequences is for us to stay as far away, to, to distance ourselves as far as we can from sin and temptation. There, these, there, there, there are some powerfully awesome spiritual parallels with what is happening in our world today. Maybe none more powerful than, than what's brought out by this quote from Thomas Brooks. That of sin being a far worse plague than any physical plague that has ever touched the human race. And yet, and yet most people, even today, as, as, as the world puts all of their efforts, shutting down economies, closing businesses, secluding people to their homes. I mean, these are extreme measures to try to save lives. Even as the human race goes to these kinds of measures people all around the globe are ignoring the plague that lives in their soul. The plague of sin. The plague of sin that, that, will, that will cost them their lives, that would, would have cost me my life, my eternal soul, would have cost me my soul had I not turned from my sin and trusted in Jesus Christ as my only hope, as my only Savior, the crucified and risen Christ. People, people are going to great lengths to fight against an earthly virus, a physical virus, when they're ignoring, they're blind to the spiritual virus of their soul. The sin, the plague of sin. The Bible says a little, a little leaven has leavened the whole lump. One man's sin... One man's sin, Romans chapter 5, has infected the entire human race. So, so it started with one person infected in the Garden of Eden when Adam stood by and passively watched his wife eat of the fruit that God had forbade them to eat of and then took, himself, took, of, took it himself and ate it himself. Adam, through his sin, sin has passed upon the entire, it has infected the entire human race and brought death upon all of us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin has a 100% infection rate to go with it a 100% death rate. That, that, listen, no one is escaping physical death no one is escaping physical death except those who trust in Jesus and who are alive at the rapture of the church. So the first remedy, the first remedy, friends, against this tactic, this scheme of Satan is for you and I as believers in Jesus Christ to train our souls to hate sin with an intense horror, with an intense hatred. That we, would, that we would call sin what it is and not try to gloss over it. And that we would create in us, that, that we would pray and ask God, God, would you generate in my heart, in my soul, a, a sincere and genuine hatred 
for the sin that is such an affront to you and your holy character. And let my love for you, first and foremost, be genuine, as Romans 12.9 says. Remedy number two is consider sin bittersweet. Consider that sin is bittersweet. That, that, what, that what is... What is it, the, the thing that Satan has baited the hook with? That, that consider, consider that as bittersweet. If it's the lust of your heart, it's bittersweet. Run from it. Flee from it. If it's lying to cover up your tracks, run from it and flee from it. If it's, if it's gossip or slander, run from it. Flee from it. Knowing and recognizing that, that, that whatever it is that's that's on that hook. It's bittersweet. Job chapter 20, verses 12 through 14 says this, Though evil is sweet in his mouth, though he hides it under his tongue, though he is loath to let it go and holds it in his mouth, yet his food is turned in his stomach. It is the venom of cobras within him. Thomas Brooks writes, Many eat, many eat that on earth, what they, what they digest in hell. Many eat that on earth, what they digest in hell. He goes on, Sins murdering morsels will deceive those who devour them. Adam's fruit was bittersweet. Esau's bowl of stew was bittersweet. You remember Esau trading his birthright for a bowl of soup. His stew, Brooks writes, was bittersweet. The Israelites' quail in the wilderness was bittersweet. Jonathan's honey was bittersweet. Adonijah's dainties, a bittersweet. After the meal is ended, then comes the reckoning, he wrote. When the meal is ended, when you've, when you've bit the hook and you've tasted the morsel of the bait that was on the hook and its sweetness hits your mouth, it almost instantly turns to pain, to bitterness, as the consequences of our sin enter into our soul and into our experience. A person gives himself to excessively drink alcohol, and at first it masks his pain and suffering even making him forget his problems and, and even in the moment to feel good. But then the violence comes, doesn't it? Then the violence comes as his stomach rejects the substance and sends it back from where it came. Sin is the same way. And that's what, that's what Job 20 talks about, verses 12 through 14. Sin masks life's sorrows for a moment. But then the violence of the consequences hit home. There is pleasure in, in sin for season, but then the day of reckoning comes. Then the consequences settle in to our life and to our souls and to our experience, to our day-by-day to our, um, -day living. The shame of sin, the pain of sin, the destruction that comes upon us is far worse than the original trouble from which we were fleeing. Though evil is sweet in his mouth, though he hides it under his tongue, though he is loath to let it go and holds it in his mouth, yet his food is turned in his stomach. It is the venom of cobras within him. Understand and consider as the second remedy to overcoming this tactic by Satan that sin is bittersweet. That sin will bring, it, not, it will not, it, it, it might not bring destruction, it will bring destruction. Sin will bring destruction into your soul and into your experience and ultimately sin causes death. Remedy number three that Brooks gives us, consider that sin will usher in the greatest and saddest losses that can be upon our souls. Consider that sin will usher in the greatest and saddest losses that can be upon our souls. There are many earthly losses that we suffer as a result of our return to sin as believers. I'm talking about believers now. That, that as believers, we've been unshackled from the power of sin. 
Sin no longer has dominion over your soul or over my soul if we are in Christ Jesus. We are free from slavery to sin. That which once chained us, those chains have been broken and we have been loosed. We have been set free. Sin no longer has a hold on us and yet for us to return to sin, for us to return to sin is, is such an affront to our crucified Savior whose blood has covered our sin and forgiven our sin. See, there are, there are many earthly losses that we suffer as a result of our return to sin, but none of those compare to the loss of the joy of being in right, re right relationship and right fellowship with God and having His favor on us. See, that's the, that's the key loss when a, Christian, when a Christian sins again, which we all do, but the key loss is a, is a break in fellowship. A break in the fellowship between us and God. When God's children sin, He must correct us in order to train us and conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. And that's what discipline is, right? It's training. God disciplines those whom He loves, Hebrews chapter 12. He trains those whom He loves. The saddest loss that we can experience, we Christians, uh, that, that we Christians can experience, is the very loss that Jesus suffered on the cross so that we could be reconciled to God. To haphazardly sin is to trample on the finished work of Christ. And so today, consider as, as the third remedy to this first scheme, this first tactic of Satan to bait the hook, to hide the consequences, consider that sin will usher in your greatest losses, my greatest losses, yours and my greatest sadness that could ever enter in upon our souls. And then fourth, he says, consider that sin is of a very deceitful and bewitching nature. Sin is of a very deceitful and bewitching nature. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 and 13 says this, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Notice he said brothers. So the writer of Hebrews is writing to Christians. He says, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. People that he thinks are saved leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Don't be hardened. Don't, don't allow your heart to be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Understand, keep reminding yourself, I need to keep reminding myself that the nature of sin is deceitful and bewitching. Sin is equal to Delilah. Think about Samson and Delilah. Sin is equal to Delilah laying in the bed of Samson, with Samson, enticing and alluring and promising wonderful happiness and fulfillment, yet always waiting for the opportune moment to run a knife in our backs. Let me say that again. Sin is equal to Delilah laying in the bed with Samson, enticing and alluring and promising wonderful happiness and fulfillment, yet always, always waiting for the opportune moment to run a knife through us. That is the nature of sin. Friends, Satan knows how to bait a hook with alluring and enticing design in order to mask the destruction and death that waits for us underneath the bait. He deceives by calling good evil and evil good. Our world, our world has mastered this concept because Satan is the prince and the power of the air who works in our midst. But Christians, Christians, we are called to resist the bait because our eyes have been opened to not only the destruction that awaits the unrepentant sinner, but we also see the hope for eternity that lives within us in relationship with our holy God. So we must resist the bait by keeping great distance between us and sin. By considering that sin is always, always bittersweet. And by remembering that sin will cost us our greatest losses 
and by our awareness of sin's deceptive nature. See, where are your greatest areas of temptation today? How does the, how does the devil, what, I should say, what bait does the devil put on that hook with regards to you and your soul? Because it's probably different than, it may be different than what, what he baits my hook with, the hook that he tries to dangle in front of me. See, see, what is it? What area is a temptation for you? What areas are temptations for you? And how does Satan bait that hook? Stop and consider the end results of you drawing near and flirting with that hook, with that bait. Consider, allow yourself to go there. Allow yourself to consider in your mind what the consequences of going there entail. The destruction that will certainly come upon you and your loved ones and ultimately the death. See, see allow, we need to allow ourselves to consider the devastating consequences of giving in to the enticement and then as we consider them, man, we need to turn away and run in the other direction. Flee, as Paul told Pastor Timothy, he says in 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Would you take some time today and just wrestle, wrestle over this. Ask yourself, do a little heart evaluation and say, yeah, what are the, what are the, what are the baits that, that Satan puts on that hook to try to lure me in? And then how can I take these four remedies how can I take these four remedies and apply them to my, uh, to my soul, to my heart in the moment of temptation? Let me pray and ask for God's help for us. Father, we thank you that you have made us keenly aware of the schemes, the tactics of our adversary. I thank you, Father, that you have not left us without help. That, Father, we have the power of the Spirit of God in us. The chains of sin have been broken. And that, God, I pray for myself, for every person who hears this, who truly knows you as Savior, that God, you will help us, help us to be keenly aware of the bait that Satan would use to tempt our, our souls so that we can apply these remedies with wisdom, with skill, with precision, so that we can overcome, so that we can endure and persevere and ultimately arrive, arrive at the shores of your presence having conquered having conquered in the powerful and wonderful name and spirit of Jesus Christ. And so I pray it in His name and for His glory. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day.